Hello, my name is Elsa Marie De Silva, founder of Red Dot Foundation and Red Dot Foundation Global, nonprofits that work on gender equity, safety and justice. Welcome to my podcast series Rethinking Well-being and Prosperity, Exploring the Horizons for Alternative Economies. It is developed for the Heinrich Boll Foundation and is in partnership with Nicor Associates, a youth-led public policy research group. Today, I am in conversation with Kawala, a leading Cameroonian entrepreneur and authority in leadership and strategy. She is the CEO of Strategies, a renowned consultancy with a global presence. Over 90% of their revenue comes from international clients, a testament to her global impact. Ka's political activism began in 1989, advocating for democracy. She was a vital figure in the Social Democratic Front and contested the removal of presidential term limits in 2008. She later founded the Cameroonian People's Party, embracing a new era of African political leadership focused on good governance and democracy. During the podcast, we will get Ka's insights on healthcare and economic challenges in African countries and what might good economic models look like. Good afternoon, Kawala. Welcome to my podcast. How are you today? So happy to be here, to be able to discuss with you. Um, We've had a number of discussions on different occasions. Congratulations for your work and for this podcast. Um, And greetings to everybody from Douala, Cameroon. Thank you, Ka. And it's always a pleasure to have you on my podcast. We are discussing rethinking well-being and prosperity and exploring horizons for alternative economies. In your opinion, how can international organizations, development partners and regional institutions better support African governments in developing systemic solutions that prioritize the needs of citizens, especially during disasters like the pandemic that we had? And what impact would this have on the country's wellness indicators? Mm. You know, I think that one of the most important things that development partners and other, you know, even uh, the governments can do with regard to freaking governments is to is to work on this aspect of accountability. And I want to address the, the element of accountability on two fronts. One is on the the fundamental shift that you are talking about, Elsa, that is to have different indicators, not just GDP, to develop a set of different indicators. In my opinion, in Africa, it is things like how many more people got access to water, how many more people got access to electricity. If we are talking about the situation like the pandemic, It is not only about addressing the disease, but it is also about using that moment to fundamentally shift the health system so that more people um, have more access to health care. So it's really thinking about the indicators in that sense. And then the, the second is really developing partnerships with our governments so that they are really accountable for the money that they received. If you look at um, the situation during COVID-19, Africa received huge amounts of money, really a lot of money. But I do not know of a single African country that can really demonstrate how it improved its health system in terms of infrastructure, in terms of increasing accessibility to citizens, in terms of even training staff. You know, how did we really improve our health systems during this period? So I think this is what the focus needs to be on partnerships with the West. That's such an important point. And, uh, you know, accountability is the key to everything I feel. In several of your papers and public speeches, you mentioned disruptions in export revenues, diaspora transfers, unemployment rates and tourism. 
Do you think that these indicators can be a better representation of an economy economy's growth status when compared to GDP? I think that diaspora transfers, tourism, and so on um, can certainly should certainly be included, but I think we really need to measure impact. I think we really need to measure impact in terms of the goods and the services that citizens are receiving. You know, we should not measure growth only on the production end. How much money did we make? I think in most of our countries in the global south, there is, of course, the question of, you know, how much money uh, uh, did you produce or how much money did you get? But I think even more fundamental is what did you do with the money? What development impacts were actually obtained with the money um, that was either produced by the country or received through, through transfers or gotten through tourism and so on? Now, since you mentioned healthcare, what is the quality of healthcare accessible to the citizens of the country as one of the important indicators? Is there a place for indigenous customs of health? You know, so like I live in India, Ayurveda is a big uh, part of our healthcare. In addition, or as an alternative sometimes to Western medicine, and now there's a lot of emphasis being put on that. I'm sure even in Africa, in many of the countries, you would have your own indigenous customs. Is that being promoted? Is that being uh, developed further? Is there room for any of it to coexist, if you will, with Western medicine? And uh, do you think if it's not currently being done, should it be done? Absolutely, there's room for it to coexist. In reality, it's already coexisting. So citizens already use both, right? Um, I think uh, uh, um, definitely in Cameroon, but I think throughout Africa, Africans have a tendency to believe very strongly in traditional medicine, um, which has the advantage of being more holistic than uh, Western medicine, and they use both jointly. I think where the work needs to be done is really on the part of government. And there, from what I understand, I think we have one or two things to learn from India in the sense that I think that the traditional medicine is lacking for traditional medicine to really be full service to the citizen is creating norms. It's creating norms. It is creating a formal, I think that, Traditional medicine and, you know, Western style medicine are already coexisting. For most Africans, we still have a very strong belief in our traditional medicine, which has the advantage of being more holistic than Western medicine. So definitely in Cameroon and I think throughout Africa, citizens, they use both their traditional medicine and they will also go to a Western style hospital. Where the work needs to be done, and I think there we can learn some things from India, for traditional medicine, it is creating the standards and the norms, the standards for training, for somebody to consider themselves a a, a traditional doctor or healer. Um, I think we are at the stage where we should have standards. They should have a, a specific training process and standards that they have to meet so that they can um, then offer their services to, um, to, to citizens in, in a manner that is safe um, and that is reliable. In the same way, we need standards and norms so that officially in hospitals, so in, in Cameroon right now, these two systems are completely separate. You have the hospital building, you know, with lots of government resources, and then traditional medicine is very informal, it is very much on a on a on a uh, hearsay basis. So people, you know, you just get word of mouth to go to traditional medicine. If we create norms and standards, these two can coexist 
within the healthcare system. It, it should be that you can offer both. And the reality in Cameroon, you have certain illnesses. For example, when you, when you have hepatitis in Cameroon, the doctors will go so far and will tell you to go to traditional medicine. It's knowledge that traditional medicine is better at um, treating uh, hepatitis, for example, or that what, what is done in the hospitals needs to be complemented with a uh, certain treatment from traditional medicine. So what is lacking is the norms, the structuring of it, the standards so that there is safety for citizens and so that we knock out the charlatans because we there are a lot of charlatans in traditional medicine because it is informal and there is no system of controlling quality and controlling, you know, what, who actually puts their services and what about mental health? Because again, you know, a lot of emphasis is put on physical health and even in medicine, mental health aspects, not often integrated into, you know, regular medical uh, solutions. And as a result, you know, you have a severe shortage of mental health professionals, even in India. And it's only been post-pandemic that we've recognized the importance of mental health and now people are talking about it. Otherwise, earlier it was a taboo topic. Is it the same in Africa? And, you know, what can be done to improve and possibly integrate into all? This is absolutely the same. Even imagine that in some of our countries, we are even in a worse situation. The mental health is highly neglected or at the level of the standard healthcare system. In traditional medicine, when I said it's a little bit more holistic, it does, traditional medicine has a tendency to take into account that, that mental health aspect. But once again, because it's normalized, it doesn't have norms, it doesn't have standards, there is a lot of abuse of mental health that happens with uh, traditional healers who so really, the, the need is extreme. And I think that acknowledging the importance of mental health care, one, because, you know, now living in this modern society with a lot of stress, with a lot of different factors that are affected, but also because in many of our countries, we have conflict. And when you have conflict, you have extreme violence throughout the community, but extreme violence uh, particularly towards the most vulnerable. So that means towards women, towards children, towards people who are living with disabilities. And even where you are able to remove people from the conflict situation, so we have a lot of displaced, for example, in Cameroon, people who leave the conflict area to move to a safer area, these people have been traumatized and they are in desperate need of um, mental health care. And so I think, you know, the need for, for really improving mental health care in our healthcare system is acute and it is urgent. In one of your articles, you emphasize the importance of African leadership anchored in culture, history and creativity. How can this culturally grounded leadership contribute to economic growth and well-being on the continent, especially in terms of GDP? I think that, you know, we've just given the example of the healthcare uh, system of integrating our traditional healthcare into the modern healthcare system. Imagine what it would do if we had formalized training for traditional um, health care, if we had norms for the types of um, medicines that are prescribed within that system, look at the number of jobs you would create. Look at the industry that you would create in terms of traditional medicines. You know, if you look at our cultural industries in terms of our music, our art, and so on, the best example of that is Nigeria. Nigerian artists today, you walk down the street anywhere in the world, you know, within a space of 30 to 45 minutes, you are going to hear Nigerian music. And this is just because there has been some investment into that industry in Nigeria. It has opened up a whole segment of the economy. 
Nigeria, when they officially started including the, the income from their film industry and their music industry, which they had not in the past, they became the number one economy in Africa just by counting what was being produced in that sector. And I think throughout Africa, you have incredible creativity and genius in the artistic, in the cultural sectors, um, which are left on the margins in all of our economies developing in that area. But also, again, all of our traditional know-how, whether in areas like agricultural production, uh, fishing, um, you know, uh, we have a lot of traditional know-how that the way that we govern today, it's very colonial. It, you know, the colonial mindset was that everything that was ours was bad, and it was only the things that were brought from the, the West that were good. Unfortunately, you know, 60 years after independence, many of the people who govern in Africa still use that mindset, and they do not integrate African knowledge, know-how, culture, and all of our different economic activities into the production sector for it to actually generate income for us as GDP. Do you think more women should be in presidential uh, positions or positions of power so that they can change the way that uh, we govern and turn the dynamics on its head? Absolutely. And there again, traditionally in Africa, Women have been a part of governance. We lost it with colonialism. If I take my country, Cameroon, the part of the country that I come from, which is in what we call the grass fields of Cameroon, in that part of the country, there is no position of power where you have a man and you do not have his female counterpart. None. From the family head, all the way up to the village head. Every position of power there, you have a male figure of power and you have a female figure of power and you have institutions that support both. And when you have decision-making mechanisms where both are integrated into the governance, this is also what I mean when I talk about an African governance that is rooted in our culture because it is with colonialism that, you know, the Westerners came with their patriarchy and shoved the women to one side and completely out of the formal institutions of decision making. The other thing which is very clear to me today as I work with African women leaders and we communicate together and, you know, work together, it's very clear that Africa is missing out on its growth. It's missing out on some really tremendous creative visions of how we could solve our problems. And most importantly, it is missing out on leaders who are really centered on the well-being of the citizen. I think the advantage of women in this moment is that we have been responsible for caring for human beings now for centuries. We care for children, we care for families, we care for the elderly, we care for the sick. And so the centering of governance, of leadership on the human being, and that human being's well-being is an advantage that very, very many women leaders have. And therefore, I think you've advocated that African leadership should be well-connected globally while still rooted in local contexts. Absolutely. Can you also share, because you mentioned, uh, you know, the political impact of COVID-19 on, on elections. How might political instability stemming from election-related challenges influence the economic situation and well-being of citizens in affected countries? Well, I think, unfortunately, in this moment throughout Africa, we have extreme political instability. Well, um, you know, for the first time since the period of independence, we have a frequency of coup d'etats. We have had eight in the last two years since, uh, in the last three years since 2020. 
uh, one of the reasons for these coup d'etats is that elections are simply not working. Elections are not working, in my opinion, because we have a tendency to look at the election, the day when you go and vote, and to um, not pay sufficient foundation to the foundations of an election. The foundation of an election is fundamental human rights. So if people do not have political freedom to truly speak their opinion and to truly hold their political opinion, then you're not going to have a good election. If all the candidates do not have the same freedom of movement throughout the country, if they do not have the same access to resources so that they can have political debate, if you do not have open spaces for political debate where citizens can ask politicians questions and can demand accountability from politicians, then you cannot have a good election. So I think one of the things that is fundamental in Africa is going back to look at these fundamental rights. When somebody says we're going to hold an election, we should look at in that country, do people have freedom of movement? Do they have freedom of speech? Do they have, does the media function and have real ability to you know, inform the public square. These fundamental freedoms, unfortunately, in Africa, we are really, really struggling with in most of our countries. And they are resulting in bad elections that the population um, is not fooled by at all. And that is why you see we end up in military coup d'etats because uh, people are convinced that those who are leading have closed up of the electoral route as a route for change, as a route for demanding accountability from elected officials. And instead, you know, when people feel like they've been backed into a corner, then they feel justified in using the coup d'etat. These coup d'etats are unfortunately getting popular support. What you see today in Africa is that when the coup happens, people are out on the street jubilating. And why are they jubilating? Because you have blocked off elections as a means for them to get accountability from leaders and to select the leaders that they truly want. We are really in not in a good place as concerns political stability and as concerns our growth towards more democratic societies. And um, this is really something that we need to sort out and that also all of our partners and all of the international institutions that we belong to, whether it is the G20 with the India or the, the big institutions, the UN, the, the World Bank and the IMF, all of these institutions really need to focus on these fundamental rights of citizens because so not respecting these fundamental rights is really leading us to a place of instability. When you have instability, you cannot grow economically. Um, you, you continue to be in poverty. You have no wherewithal to face the shocks that you cannot control. So you have no ability to deal with climate. You have no ability to deal with pandemics. You have no ability to, you know, really withstand and be resilient, you know, when faced with these uh, external shocks, when you have not built that fundamental stability in a country. What makes you uh, get out of bed every morning and are you hopeful for the future? I am absolutely hopeful for the future. I'm very realistic in what we are facing, but I am very, very hopeful for the future because I work with citizens every single day who are working to solve these issues. I think that what we must encourage our young people, our women, people who are living with disabilities, all of those groups who have been shut out of the decision-making processes and out of the political processes in our countries, we have to encourage them, one, to be informed, 
two, to be trained, and three, to take the necessary action to insert themselves. Nobody is going to give it to them, but they have to take action to insert themselves into these political processes, into these decision-making processes. They have to do it without violence, but with a lot of determination, whether it is through advocacy, whether it is through protest, however it is, they must make their voices heard because that is how you, you, you get leaders to pay attention. And I work every day on this training, on this information. And I see, you know, these groups, whether it's women or it's young people who are determined to shape a better future for themselves. And so that gives me a lot of hope. I have a lot of hope from talking to women leaders from across the world, Elsa, um, from some of the circles where you and I have met before and seeing that, you know, across the globe, women are saying, We've got to do it differently. They are inserting their voices into artificial intelligence, into architecture, into urban planning, into agriculture, into the economy, and saying the model we have as a world is not working for us. And we have to do things differently. And they're not only analyzing the problem, they're bringing solutions to the table. So this encourages me very much, gives me hope. I do feel we must transform leadership if we are going to see a significant change in our lifetime. And that is why in my work, I am focused on that aspect of the transformation of political leadership in my country and in Africa as well. Thank you, Ka. This was such a delightful conversation, very thought-provoking. And yes, you know, we are part of an amazing group of women leaders making the difference in whatever way we can. Thank you so much, Elsa. It's a real pleasure. And um, I love that we're, ma- we're continuing to make the connections even when we are so long away from one another. Thank you.